Dear friends and colleagues, welcome to the inaugural Air Transport Symposium. The theme of this year is the new era building the future of the air transport. This year event is live stream and I would like to welcome the guests uh, looking uh, via YouTube this event today. Also, uh, I would like to thank our sponsors, Athens International Airport, Ambros, and Engine Lease Finance that uh, supported uh, the organization of uh, today's uh, gathering. COVID has shown us that we humans are all the same. Independently of where we live, what color we have, what religion we believe in, whether we are poor or rich, it has also shown us that health should not be taken for granted. It has shown us how our modern societies are interconnected and has been affected. It has reminded us of the real priorities of life and how important the human communication is, touching, hugging, feeling each other. Aviation, the business of freedom, of democracy, of bringing people together during the pandemic helped people to reunite, repatriated people, move fast sanitary products that we all need, urgently needed, and then transported the vaccines. Now that COVID is on its sunset, we have to think about the future of air transport, about rebuilding our great industry on a more solid, strong yet flexible basis. We must not forget that 1919, the year that Spanish flu appeared, was the very year that air transport was really born. And airlines like KLM and Qantas established at that time are still around. We have to be optimistic, realistic, and continue to have and share the passion of flying. People now, more than ever, need to reconnect and explore our great planet. Let's bring people together and make them dream again. Thank you. And now I have the, the honor and pleasure to invite Dr. Christos Tsituras, who is the governor, governor of the Hellenic Civil Aviation Authority. Please. Dr. Iatru, esteemed delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to welcome you all to this Air Transport Symposium that will bring into focus some of the key challenges and opportunities in building the future of air transport. Let me please begin by extending my most sincere thanks to the organizers of this event that will foster the dialogue between leaders of the aviation industry. As this is my first opportunity to address this symposium as the Hellenic Civil Aviation Authority Governor, I wish to assure you of the importance we assign to the growth and challenges for the future of the air transport industry, which is an increasingly essential component of our global society with a significant economic footprint. Let me provide some perspective of the role of the new Hellenic Civil Aviation Authority, which has already assumed its responsibility since last January. Hellenic Civil Aviation Authority, or APA, as abbreviated in Greek, is a landmark legislative initiative of the Hellenic Republic that will contribute greatly to a truly effective and comprehensive regulatory framework and will therefore support the varied but often complementary needs of the commercial aviation operators. We recognize that in these times of crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the stakeholders need efficiency, right advice and information, well-educated personnel, and seamless experience across multiple channels in the authority. They expect rapid deployment of new tools and innovations, transparency, and trust when interacting with the regulatory authority. The CAA 
having recently signed a partnership agreement with EASA, is reinforcing the skills of its workforce and adapting its processes, methodologies, and tools to oversee and regulate the aviation sector, but also to enable the delivery of change. Aviation industry is transitioning and introducing new solutions and technologies, artificial intelligence applications, new cutting edge technologies, air taxi and package delivery drones, electric aircraft, and new business models in aviation are being adapted. My vision for the CAA is to create an agile and effective framework that will support the recovery of all the aviation stakeholders in the post-COVID era, while also ensuring high levels of aviation safety, security, and environmental protection standards in Greece. In this context, we encourage the dialogue between aviation stakeholders and look forward to our exchange today on what we can achieve together to lead our industry into a new aviation reality. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, um, in my capacity as president of the Hellenic uh, Aviation Society, I would like to warmly thank you to uh, today's uh, 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 event. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to have you all here. I would like to uh, uh, warmly thank uh, Dr. Costa Seatru for uh, organizing this um, uh, remarkable event, as always. Um, as you uh, know, we'll act as the uh, chairperson of uh, uh, this particular event. Uh, I will start with some uh, notes about setting the scene and then uh, we'll proceed with uh, uh, the rest of the program. Um, as already mentioned, um, year 2020 was uh, an annus horribilis, as we say in Latin, uh, for a transport. Um, it was a year that, uh, uh, as we all know, uh, traffic collapsed. That's the exact uh, uh, words used by ICAO. Huh? Between uh, uh, 2020 and 2019, uh, we saw a reduction of uh, air traffic by 60%. Uh, 2021 was uh, slightly better compared to 2019. We saw a reduction of 49%. Uh, but still, uh, we all suffer from the uh, uh, negative uh, uh, impact of the pandemic. Huh? If things go well, uh, the reduction between 2022 compared to 2019 will be uh, in the area between 26 and uh, 31%. Uh, if things go well, and according to Euro control, at least uh, with respect to Europe, uh, we expect to see a full recovery by 2024, huh? so in two years uh, from now. Uh, likewise, uh, same news for, for tourism. Uh, as we all know, very few people fly for the sake of flying. Most people fly to go somewhere and do something. So uh, when we discuss about uh, uh, transport, it's also important to discuss about uh, uh, tourism. Huh? We saw uh, a sharp decline of international tourism arrivals. Uh, back in 2019, uh, we uh, had about 1.5 billion travelers. Uh, that went down sharply to uh, the area of uh, 300, uh, uh, around 300 million in 20. Uh, 20. In 2021, we had 415, huh? and um, uh, still uh, we experienced a lot of uh, problems. We all hope that uh, 2022 is going to be better, but again, the uh, uh, UNWTO, which is the United Nations World Tourism Organization, uh, thinks that uh, full recovery uh, will be achieved uh, uh, later on in this decade, uh, by 2024, uh, uh, and uh, most uh, experts agree with that uh, view as well. Undoubtedly, all these uh, uh, different variants uh, have uh, played uh, a negative role. Uh, back in October or November, there was uh, um, optimism. Then we had the uh, Omicron uh, variant, which uh, <coughs> obviously re reversed our plans. We very much hope that uh, uh, this will prove only temporary. Huh? We very much expect that uh, uh, this year will set the fundamentals for uh, a full recovery and uh, a return to uh, a new normality uh, in the uh, next couple of years. And uh, I mentioned the word new normality because uh, uh, we all expect to uh, get back to uh, 2019 and then to be able to surpass that particular level of uh, traffic. Uh, 
Uh, however, uh, things are never going to be the same as uh, before. Huh? Uh, before the pandemic, uh, we had the triple P, uh, the uh, public-private partnerships. Now we talk about the triple B, the Build Back Better. And that's very much about um, being able to address all the different challenges that exist. And I would term uh, and mention three main challenges. One is about business challenges, as we know, because of the devastating effect of the pandemic on uh, air traffic. Uh, uh, airlines, airports, uh, ANSPs, uh, the entire business ecosystem experienced uh, uh, very, very uh, negative uh, uh, profits and uh, uh, a sharp reduction of the revenues as well. So it's uh, uh, quite important uh, to make sure that um, uh, the sector manages to recover uh, beyond all the uh, subsidies and the support provided by the states uh, over the last uh, couple of years. So, so business challenges uh, lie ahead. Uh, it's important that the sector manage to survive. Resilience uh, uh, has proved once again of major uh, importance. And uh, I think that all the participants have to be quite innovative in terms of um, finding new sources of ancillary revenue, uh, in terms of reshaping uh, the business model as well. On top of business challenges, we should certainly refer to environmental challenges as well and the importance of climate change and how all this uh, relates to uh, transport. Uh, that was a theme to explore well uh, before the pandemic, but I think that now uh, becomes even more important uh, given all the um, uh, climatic conditions that uh, prevailed over the last uh, couple of years, uh, including great forest uh, fires, including abnormal uh, high temperatures, for example, in British Columbia, in, uh, in Canada, uh, including uh, other events as well. And as we all know, uh, transport has a, a big role to play here, and the challenging thing is how we're going to um, not reduce our transport, not to uh, uh, you know, this scale of transport, but to ensure that the transport can grow uh, well within a sustainable uh, context. Uh, so uh, environmental challenges are quite important, especially uh, in an era of uh, energy crisis. As we know, energy prices have gone up. Uh, fuel prices have gone up. Kerosene prices, of course, follow suit. And uh, that sets uh, new challenges as well. Huh? Uh, taking that into consideration, perhaps it can provide a new incentive for airlines uh, uh, to look for alternative sources of fuel. There is a big discussion about SAF, Sustainable Aviation Fuels, uh, and it's quite interesting to see how uh, the um, air transport sector will be able to uh, address uh, all these environmental challenges, reduce uh, uh, its environmental uh, footprint, and uh, uh, achieve uh, carbon neutral growth. And then, of course, we have important uh, technological issues to uh, consider. As uh, uh, discussed earlier by the governor, we need to uh, uh, take into consideration uh, major developments in terms of unmanned vehicles, in terms of drones, uh, air taxis. All this becomes uh, quite important, and it can uh, certainly set important regulatory hurdles as well. And because uh, uh, all these things are new, we need to properly uh, introduce uh, a, a solid system of uh, uh, regulating this uh, traffic to uh, the benefit of all the market participants and obviously and uh, uh, above all uh, to uh, uh, ensure that uh, uh, we keep operating in a safe and secure environment. Uh, we also have new developments in terms of uh, uh, supersonic aircraft. As you know, this is uh, an old idea dating back to the technological miracle of uh, uh, the Concorde, but now the idea is revisited uh, within a new sustainable context. So again, I think we have a, a very uh, interesting uh, intersection between um, environmental challenges, uh, uh, new technological uh, advancements, and uh, taking into consideration what I mentioned before uh, regarding uh, business challenges. So building back better is very, very important. It's very much related to uh, the topic of uh, today's symposium, uh, which is about building uh, the future of uh, transport. And I think that this uh, uh, triple B uh, uh, pairs quite well with uh, uh, the PPP. Huh? So uh, if we want to progress further, it's quite important to ensure that uh, uh, partnerships are there. Uh, what the pandemic has shown is that uh, 
uh, there are lots of uh, divide around her, there are lots of things that do unite us as well. So I think that it's quite important to uh, uh, reconsider partnerships and make sure that in this new environment, uh, different stakeholders can come together, stronger linkages uh, can be developed with uh, uh, local economies uh, uh, in a sustainable context and ensure that uh, uh, the future of transport will be uh, even brighter compared to the past. Thank you. And uh, I think we can now continue with uh, something uh, uh, quite important. And I'm, uh, I'm greatly uh, honored to uh, uh, present to you uh, uh, Dr. Costas here, true. You all know him, of course. Uh, Costas, uh, I always say, is a, a class of his own uh, in uh, uh, the um, uh, air transport uh, uh, ecosystem. And um, uh, it's a great uh, uh, honor and pleasure for me as the president of the Hellenic Aviation Society uh, to uh, introduce Kosas, who will be awarded this year's prestigious uh, uh, Kiramianakis uh, Award. A uh, few words about Kosas. Uh, uh, back in 2018, he was appointed as the Director General of the Mesa Transport Organization. Uh, as you all know, it's uh, uh, um, a very uh, new but uh, uh, very, very dynamic and uh, uh, very important uh, non governmental organization uh, in uh, uh, aviation uh, based in Montreal. Uh, Costas holds uh, a PhD in uh, transport management from Cranfield University, and he's the author of a book, 100 Years of uh, Commercial Aviation, and has also co authored another very interesting book, which uh, uh, I always uh, use in uh, uh, my lectures as well. And the title of this book is uh, Airline Choices for the Future, very much relates to uh, airline alliances. He's also the associate editor of the uh, Journal of Air Transport Studies. Uh, uh, one of uh, uh, the uh, important journals, academic journals uh, in uh, air transport. Uh, it's an open access journal. I act as the editor in chief. You are most welcome uh, to visit and uh, submit or encourage people to submit papers as well. Uh, and he also wears another hat. Huh? He's the owner of ATN, the Air Transport uh, News, one of the uh, uh, major uh, online uh, uh, publications in the context of uh, uh, transport. Uh, he's the president of the Air Transport Awards and also founder and honorary member of um, our society, the Hellenic uh, Aviation Society. Uh, very soon, the society is going to celebrate its uh, 20 years since its establishment. Uh, Cos has played a, a very pivotal role uh, in the setup and the uh, whole organization of the society, and he's um, uh, uh, one of the very, very few honorary uh, members. Uh, back in 2016, uh, Flight Safety Foundation Mediterranean awarded to ATN and uh, Costas, uh, in particular, the International Press Award for his contribution to uh, the European aviation. And um, in 2009, also, uh, Costas served as the deputy mayor of uh, uh, Cali uh, here in uh, uh, where, where we are in this uh, uh, lively. Uh, suburb of uh, Athens, uh, uh, which again proves his uh, uh, popularity not only uh, within the um, uh, aviation ecosystem, but uh, uh, at a wider level. Uh, Costas uh, uh, is married to uh, uh, Evgenia Botanopoulou. Uh, they have uh, two children, uh, George and uh, Yanis, and I'm sure he uh, uh, does uh, uh, enjoy uh, time with his uh, family when uh, he's not uh, flying around the world. So these are just a few words. Uh, Costas, thank you so much uh, for uh, being with us, for uh, being a truly remarkable uh, personality in the context of uh, uh, transport. Uh, Kiramia Nike's award is uh, uh, awarded to um, a very important personality at an international level every year. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, unanimously agreed within the board that uh, uh, Costas more than meets the criteria to be offered uh, uh, this prestigious award this year. So Costas, we're uh, greatly honored and happy that you accepted this award. And uh, please uh, uh, raise so that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, provide you with this award. Thank you.
Well, as you know me, thanks first of all to Elenica Versailles for this award. You know me, giving awards, not getting awards, then uh, it's something, an, an, an unusual situation for me, but uh, really, it's uh, really an honor and pleasure having here my family, Evgenia, Yorgos and Yanis, uh, and of course, my mother-in-law, Tula, that uh, without them, I cannot be standing with you here, and I am who I am thanks to them. And of course, to my late parents, that uh, I continue to keep the house uh, as much we can it is not easy. But um, uh, returning to aviation, I can say that uh, I tried to build and help make this aviation business to be better. Um, I don't see you as colleagues or partners, but as friends. And it's, it's the concept I always have. When we launched Hellenic Aviation Society back in 2004, uh, officially started, and uh, of course with Hermes and uh, all the other initiatives, uh, I am trying to do my best to make this uh, amazing business even better, and um, I, I hope we'll be able to contribute in the future uh, with more, uh, as sometimes I say, crazy ideas. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Kostas, and uh, uh, I think we can now uh, continue with uh, uh, our keynote speaker, and uh, uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to uh, invite uh, uh, Peter Lerbus, who is the uh, president and CEO of KLM, uh, for his uh, uh, keynote speech. Uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Um, before I uh, welcome everyone, uh, Kostas, congratulations with your award, or I should say Dr. Yatru, congratulations with your award. Uh, thanks for the wonderful hospitality, uh, Kostas, uh, Evgenia. Uh, being here is really a pleasure again. And uh, I think the timing of this event is great. If we would have been here two weeks ago, it was packed with snow, uh, <laughs> something uh, we have in the Netherlands every now and then, but I guess in Greece it's quite rare. Uh, so I saw some of the pictures, and the timing there for today, I guess, is, is just uh, great. Thanks for your hospitality and the Greek word philoxenia. I think you introduced yourself in your, in your speech. Uh, friends for foreigners, and it's really uh, great to be here. Um, it's an honor to, uh, to address all of you uh, today for uh, basically what I hope is the end of the COVID-19 pandemic and basically the timing, not only for the weather, but also for, I think, the end of the pandemic uh, is, is very well today. Uh, Professor Andreas uh, Papadeodou just introduced actually three topics, and uh, maybe it's, it's good to quickly reflect on that in the building back better. The business challenge, the environmental challenge, and the technolo technological challenge, and I guess all these elements were already very much present prior to COVID-19, but have just accelerated throughout this, uh, this crazy two years which are, are behind us. Um, and again, I really hope, and we see more and more signals of that, that we see a swift recovery uh, of travel and people wanting to get back in the air. In um, some of the media we saw at the beginning of the crisis, some expectations that uh, this will change forever and people will no longer fly to destinations and they will stay home and do everything by Zoom and video. Uh, I think it's the, this last summer, I was just speaking to some people, has proven to be very wrong uh, in, in that sense. People just want to get back in the air and go to their, their places. Looking back to, uh, to these years, and Costas was... Um, kindly referring to 1919, the year KLM was, uh, was founded, um, which means that we celebrated 100 years of our history in 2019. Uh, and uh, actually, we were and are the first airline in the world achieving that under its original name. Um, I think I mentioned it before, British Airways has claimed it every now and then, but they changed their names, I think, three or four times along the way, so we don't count that anymore. Uh, for us, it was under the original name, uh, and we celebrated that. So that was in October 2019, um, so you could imagine that was 
basically a year full of festivities and a year full of great joyment and pride and all the 30,000, uh, at that time 33,000 employees were sincerely joining, enjoying it and we had hangar events with thousands of people coming there. I traveled all across the world to celebrate 100 years of KLM. So that was October 2019 um, and just basically six months later from a daily welcoming of 120 thousand customers we drop down to three thousand customers per day so that that's basically in a, in a time frame of just six months we were on the peak of celebrations enjoyment pride and so on to basically out of the 200 aircraft probably 180 were parked and we were down from 120,000 customers a day down to roughly 3,000 a day in the worst part of the uh, the crisis at the beginning of um, I should say March April 2020 if we look back to the past year, 2021, I, I really believe it has been a year of resilience. And I recall at the beginning of the year, everyone was expecting the vaccination is there, will go quickly better. And how wrong could we be? Because especially the first quarter of 21 was again a very challenging year. And with that, I, I do believe that the year 2021 has become, for many airlines, a year of resilience. Uh, a year where we thought it, the worst was behind us, and it really wasn't. On a positive note, that gave us the time, uh, thinking about the environmental challenge, to work a bit more on preparing for that environmental challenge, which is waiting us really now. And if we see the, the, the landscape in Europe and also my country, the Netherlands, a lot of pressure uh, is on us in order to change much quicker than we wanted to do so far, than we could do so far. And the only way of doing that is to collaborate between various stakeholders. So we have embraced a rather uh, ambitious plan in terms of uh, increasing the amount of sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, we do have a mandatory uh, today 0.5 percent as from early January for all our customers where they can increase. We do have an extensive program for our corporate customers and we have introduced a sustainable aviation fuel programs for our cargo business which again was probably unheard of prior to COVID. It's very much part of, of our business now and when I was in Dubai recently we even signed a few more agreements with Four Waters and many of our cargo customers really want to go into sustainable aviation fuels. I think it's really a sign of sign of this time and age that there's so much interest in uh, in doing that. So I believe here collaboration is the step forward. Next to the present sustainable aviation fuels, we had the first flight operated in Amsterdam in the March of this year, uh, of actually last year, on synthetic fuel. Together with Shell, we had a first flight operated on synthetic fuel, still a small batch, still at the early stages. But again here, it has to start somewhere. I think it's really an important step that we start to change from from the bio-based sustainable aviation fuel to synthetic fuels, which uh, in a way are even better and easier uh, to make going forward. So this whole environmental push is really helping us, I guess, as an industry to take up an even more important role going forward. And with that, I think the theme of today in the, the, the new era is really around not only customers coming back and indeed, uh, Professor, you're absolutely right, a business challenge to, to be fulfilled. I don't think the volumes is going to be a challenge, but we all took a lot of debt on our shoulders in these difficult times, and we need one way or the other uh, to pay it back. So the discussion I'm having with Schiphol Airport is, of course, at what speed can we pay that back? So for the airports here in the room, uh, think about the airlines. We need, to, we need to have a little bit more time to get back uh, on our feet, if I may give that message uh, at, uh, to you, and I'm sure you will allow me to do so. Um, but with that, with that business challenge, it, it goes really hand in hand, and I'm glad it's being mentioned, the technological side of it. And here, again, we see a rapid, uh, a rapid speed on electrical flying. We have decided that for our flight school, where, of course, these are the smaller aircraft. We do have our own flight school. We move to all electric aircraft, which is, I think is very important and very meaningful step. It's, it's too small today for commercial aviation, but again here is an important step in what we do going forward. So we'll start with, uh, with that. We have uh, uh, stepped into uh, a big fleet renewal plan as sort of more classical but important part in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, getting our environmental footprint further reduced, and that's going to be planned in the next couple of uh, years to replace all the existing uh, narrow-body fleet. So all in all, uh, 
um, thank you for, for your attention. We look with a lot of confidence forward to the year 2022. It's going to be a better year than 21, as 21 was a better year of 2020. I'm sure there's going to be a, a new bumps and unexpected developments, uh, but as an industry, we have demonstrated that we are able to handle that and deal with that. So in closure, uh, Costa, thanks for, for the organization. Thanks for making this possible. Thanks for getting those for coming from abroad to Athens, which is never a punishment, uh, being here uh, and, uh, and seeing people and talking to people. So thank you for, for organizing that and the importance you attach to this industry and the way you get people uh, together. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Elbers, for this uh, very insightful uh, speech. And uh, now I'm turning to uh, uh, Ms. Joanna Budobulu, who is the Director of uh, Communications and Marketing at Athens International Airport, and uh, uh, who will act as uh, uh, the moderator for uh, the next uh, panel. Joanna, all over to you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First of all, let me thank Dr. Iatru for the organization of this event and, of course, congratulate you, Costas, on the award that you have just received. Um, I think we've heard a lot. We, ha we, we had already Professor Andreas Papatheodorou uh, giving a very comprehensive setting of the scene uh, for aviation and not only for the challenges ahead. We had two very insightful keynote speeches. The first one from uh, Dr. Christos uh, Tsituras, Governor of the Hellenic Civil Aviation Authority, and of course by Mr. Peter Elbers, the President and CEO of KLM. And uh, now I have to say that I feel humbled by the presence of uh, four top leaders, two airline CEOs, two airport CEOs here in the room. 
I think we will have the opportunity to discuss with them about the challenges, about uh, the real everyday life uh, that the airlines and the airports uh, face within this very uh, difficult situation, within, within this ongoing unprecedented crisis. And without further ado, I would like to introduce to you in alphabetical order, uh, first of all, Mr. Adelali, Group CEO, Air Arabia, Mr. Mehmet Nane, CEO, Pegasus Airlines, Dr. Yanis Paraschis, CEO, Athens International Airport, and Mr. Kadri Samsung. Lu, uh, CEO, Istanbul Grand Airport. We have heard a lot uh, by the, uh, the previous speakers about building back better. And uh, actually, um, we know that uh, pre the, pre the US President Joe Biden was credited with, credited with the term, uh, but this was not the case. I think the first one that uh, used the term uh, was the former Prime Minister of Japan, Mr. Shinzo Abe, uh, during the third uh, UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction. In it was held in Sendai, Japan in 2015. Uh, so much for the history of the term. Uh, let's go uh, to our first question. How does Build Back Better look like to you? How would you describe it, both for the aviation sector and in specific for the company you run? And Mr. Adelali, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I, I think uh, what was... Is this working? I think um, it's working. I think it's working. What was talked about earlier on, and we hear on both keynote speakers, that uh, we got to look at the aftermath of pandemic, which was probably in process there. Um, the, the, the industry altogether uh, were too comfortable in 2019 and before, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, there was a lot of complacency uh, that it will always be there. Mm -hmm. And the, the, no, with all respect to, to 100 years, we're very young. But, but a lot of airlines thought would always be there and life would never be difficult. Uh, this pandemic, if there was one good thing, it taught us all that complacency is a bad thing and you can't wait for the problem to fix it. Mm -hmm. Anticipate issues in, in, in a business that probably changes every week. And, and your five-year strategy changes every year. Uh, because of the various pressures that you've got around you. I, I, I hope that after the month of this pandemic, airlines will be able to sort of think a little bit more about not only the seat factor, not only uh, cutting down the prices, but look at it as a good business, a sustainable business that makes profit. Mm -hmm. And that should be, in, in my opinion, the start of the, of the building of this, this industry back on its feet. Thank you very much. Mr. Mehmet Nanne. So the question, what you ask, we have to say how we are going to achieve that. How we are going to get a swift so recovery, I would say. There are three main issues it mm -hmm. was addressed until now. One of them is the business, mm -hmm. environmental, and the digital one. So what we have done as Pegasus, we are, as a developing country in Turkey, used to for the crisis. In 2016, we had a crisis. It was only our crisis, not a pandemic like this global crisis. And some, what happened in our country in that years can happen in a Western country in 100 years. So the business fell down in aviation and tourism by 35%. But next year, it was par with 2015. So dynamism is also there. In that context, we decided three C's, cost, cash, capacity. And we were successful at that time, and we get out of the crisis stronger. So we control our costs, we control our cash, and in order to have the cash, instead of going to the bank, we sold certain assets which we own, the aircraft, and built our own cash, because the cost of the funding was so high, and again, the Capacity management is very crucial. If needed, we are ready to give our aircraft as a wet lease. Mm -hmm. So, but when we have the global crisis, we add two more stuff, like Abdel Ali said, complacency and customer. And customer is also domestic and passengers. Inter our employees are also our domestic internal customers. So this pandemic change, that scene also, giving the masks, providing them the vaccination, 
providing them the disinfectation and providing them secure environment became very crucial, both for our passengers and for our employees. Of course, in order to bundle this, we have to be environment friendly also, but not only environment friendly, we as a company summarize this under ESG as it was done. Yeah. So environment is very important for us. Socialization is very important for us. Just for the make you laugh, the number of marriages in Turkey decreased. <laughs> Do you know the reason? Because people couldn't be able to come together during the breaks in the offices because it's one of the main source to see your spouse and to meet your spouse and to decide for the marriage. Because we couldn't be <laughs> able to go to the offices. In our company, we only go twice, a tw yeah, two yeah, days, twice, twice, twice a week, a week. Yeah. and 30% of the performance. So we do not want to have get infected. It will be negatively affect our operations. So social side is getting important sure. in general, sure. and governance Absolutely. side is getting very important. So what we are doing in this context, I think I can talk on that also, sure. but do you want some information? No, no, no. Actually, I think that what you mentioned, it's the three C strategy on the way ahead. Plus two and then Cs. Of course, plus two Cs, yes. Five and Cs. So, uh, we have we heard the airlines talking about building back better. Let's go to the airports now. Dr. Yanis Paraschis, Athens oh, International oh, Airport. Al <laughs> alphabetical <laughs> order. Guess, guess. But that's okay. I, I, I go with the alphabetical order, but <laughs> yeah. we can give the floor to Mr. Sampson. <coughs> From our perspective, of course, we are the youngest player in the sector. And, and a very uh, impressive one, I thank have you, to say. Thank you. And we encountered so many troubles since the opening of the operation. And I think the pandemic was something we, ne we never considered to hit us after so, such yep. a big investment. Sure. Um, I think for, the, for, for airports, the, the case is a bit different because if if the airlines don't use us, we are, we are, we are meaningless institutions. And um, my takeaway from this um, build better uh, in the future is basically the public and private sector uh, should really find out the method to work better together. That's something we I think believe we kind of succeeded in Turkey quite a lot mm -hmm. because we work very closely with the government ministers and institutions. But what hit us the most was that the, during most part of this process, the, dri the health minister was in the driving seat. So f to prepare the sector better for the future, I'm, we are trying to tell the relevant ministers, like the transportation minister, that they should really not let the seat to the, to the health minister, who is just <laughs> really caring about the well-being of the people debate. and yeah. doesn't have a holistic yeah. view about the sector. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to undertakings, like we have to the state in terms of rent or to the banks in terms of debt, we are on our own. Yeah. I mean, we are being asked to help the airlines but at the same time, we are also asking airlines to give them us the money, so we we fulfill our, our uh, commitments to the state and as well as the banks. Mm -hmm. And between us and the airlines <coughs> to build better, I think there should be better integration. For instance, for my case, it's Turkish airline. It's a gigantic airline. They have their own set of rules. They usually see us like a, I mean, facilitator for their business model. That's the the wording that I would use, but we are telling, we are, we are relaying them the message that we need to be really work together and whatever data we collect, we should analyze together. Mm -hmm. Because what they are treating, they are treating the same customer in the air, and I'm treating them at the airport for two to four hours. So unless we do things together in a, in a, in a consolidated manner, our efforts are going to be useless. Because so it's mainly for synergies, airports, yeah. airlines, yeah. working closer together, public-private partnership, you mentioned before, so this is also very important. And of course, trying to get to the driver's seat again. I mean, aviation sector being in the place uh, where we will make our own decisions again, not having and, probably and other... And, and of course, I mean, for us, 
for airlines is the same technology plays a key role. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we should make our facilities contactless as much as we can. Yeah. Sure. We should definitely provide more comfort to the passengers and the users of our facilities about the hygiene, sanitation, cleaning. So they won't really question us more. Even the pandemic is over. That yeah. They, it's a safe place to use, mm -hmm. and, and therefore, um, we have a lot of takeaways from this from this pandemic. Um, it it can hit us in the future again. Of That's course, obvious. absolutely, so absolutely. I think collaboration, harmonization, and technology will be a key elements to beat the key uh, elements upcoming to, upcoming yep. uh, cases in the future. Thank you, and the floor is yours, Dr. Paraskis. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the. Kind invitation is uh, it's always a great pleasure to see so many friends and uh, well-known faces back in Athens. Uh, we need you uh, here, so thank you for coming. Um, I think the uh, there are a lot of things that somebody can take away from from uh, what we have been going through and are going through. Uh, uh, the last uh, two years. Um, actually, for us here in Greece, uh, it's, it, it is a, a, a crisis followed by another crisis with a small break of a few good years. Um, we had the, the financial crisis, uh, the world financial crisis, then we had the Greek macroeconomic crisis uh, and the fiscal crisis between 2009 and 2013. Then we had a, a good rebound, uh, not macroeconomically necessarily, but at least uh, in aviation and tourism. And then we were hit by, uh, the, uh, by the pandemic, which is uh, obviously something uh, unique, uh, not to say unprecedented. Now, um, this is not necessarily a crisis in the sense of uh, something of small duration. It is something that will have a lasting impact. Uh, on uh, not only on aviation, I think uh, on the physical economy altogether, uh, in the medium and long term. And um, what we can s say is that uh, through the waves we went through uh, in this pandemic, um, uh, that uh, you know this is a, a phenomenon that technology and uh, science uh, and human progress c cannot necessarily. Uh, beat uh, at the pace that uh, we are used to, uh, and uh, it w we need to uh, take from this that adaptability, flexibility, and resilience are uh, key uh, attitudes that we need to incorporate in our business models. I think. Uh, uh, aviation and airports in particular were never thought uh, to be exposed to this kind of risks where you have you know, from 100% you go down to zero or to 2 or 3% of uh, business activity uh, and that you need to survive elements like uh, uh, things like cash and, 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 and becomes uh, king in those situations because we need to keep our companies afloat, we need to be able to pay our people um, and and uh, we need to be able uh, to get through the worst. I think we have managed in our industry uh, to mobilize uh, different tools uh, in different jurisdictions, but we have also learned that uh, whereas we believe to be a worldwide regulated industry, and particularly even in supranational structures like, for example, the, Euro the European Union or Europe in general, the European uh, uh, aviation area, uh, where we thought that ca some kind of standardization or, uh, or regulation uh, would prevail, but th this was not the case. Uh, everybody, uh, you know, because of health and social systems being very national, somebody, everybody came up with his own rules trying to, to cope with the phenomenon. So this is another element uh, which teaches us that uh, we need uh, to be prepared uh, for things that we have taken for granted in the past, particularly being in such a uh, you know, well-regulated and, 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 uh, um, and, and internationally um, exposed industry. Mm -hmm. Now, 
I think for the years to come, we have a lot of challenges ahead because uh, I think the phenomenon is not yet over, uh, but the phenomenon uh, of the pandemic will leave a set of uh, changes uh, or comes with a set of changes. Uh, this relates uh, to uh, the disruption in the supply chains around the world. That would mean uh, uh, inflation, uh, that will mean en disruption in the energy sector, uh, that will mean disruption and changes in the workplace altogether and uh, the labor markets. And of course, over all this, there is a, an umbrella which was there before, but now comes at a very pronounced uh, uh, pace, which is uh, the, all, the whole question of sustainability, which is also you know, more pronounced in certain parts of the world, but definitely here in Europe. We are, you know, the ones that uh, definitely will be impacted in the years to come. Thank so, you. Uh, a lot of a lot of <laughs> things to, to a lot to, of things to discuss. To stay, yeah. Uh, yeah. awake at night. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think sustainability. We will have the opportunity to discuss today later in another, let's say, question and round of uh, questions. I will keep that nothing is, you can never say that anything is granted, so I keep that. And we'll also keep resilience. And maybe I should add anti-fragility. It's a new term um, coined by Mr. Nicholas Taleb, a very well-known um, scientist. Yeah, the black swan and so on. So I think resilience, anti-fragility is something that we need in the aviation sector. We have proven that we are resilient, I think, during these two years a little bit more than two years. And I think we'll now discuss in a little bit more technical way about newer generation, new generation of aircraft. And I think I will start with airlines again, with Mr. Nane. Uh, would you consider that new aircraft types will accelerate the shift towards point-to-point -to -point travel in the post-pandemic era? We have seen during the pandemic a lot of shifting towards point-to-point, -to -point, and there were reasons for that. But do you think that this is something that we will see in the post-pandemic era? Which are the opportunities? Which are the threats for airlines? And then, of course, we will pass to the airport side of things. I think there is always an opportunity, but it's very crucial, the new type of aircraft mm -hmm. or the technology to come true. So when we are looking, we can't see any commercialized new technology at the moment. Of course, there are certain preconditions for that. For example, using the electricity engines. But the OEM manufacturers are working on that, but currently we don't have anything concrete that we can talk. But what we can do, we can do a lot. SAF and the synthetic part of the SAF is very crucial. As That's the right. airlines and as the aviation industry, we can put for the manufacturers real pressure. Currently, if you want to buy SAF, can you able to provide it? Can you find it in Greece? No. Can you find it in my country? No, because there are no manufacturers. Or the amount of SAF manufactured is not enough to cultivate our requirements. Mm -hmm. We are using more than 800,000 tons jet fuel per year. And what is the pro availability of SAF globally to serve only one company? when you look at global requirements. Second, the OEM manufacturers, we believe that must spend more energy and more time on the new type of the engines. First for the SAF, second for the environmental friendly. As IATA, we promised something as the airlines. In 2015, we set zero carbon emission. Of course, certain companies like mine put interim targets because from today to 2050 is long and I believe I don't will I won't will be around. <laughs> you never but know. No, never we know. never know but according to the general age of the man in Turkey I won't be around <laughs> but we have to put interim targets for example we are one of the very unique companies not only in my country but in the global context who put the interim targets for 2030. We said that as Pegasus, we would like to reduce our carbon emission 25% compared to 2019 figures. So we have to be really concrete what we want to achieve. It's we do not have to do it just for saying it. We have to do it really and demonstrate it. And for this purpose, we have to unite our forces. The fuel manufacturers, the engine manufacturers, the OEM manufacturers, 
all the related parties, including the airports, we have to come together and we have to find an amicable solution to this. Else, we will be accused as polluting the environment, which, by the way, I would like to highlight. Aviation industry, the carbon emission secretion per year is one third of the sea freight. True. But I don't know why people are concentrated on the aviation. The sea freight produces three times more carbon emission compared to the aviation industry. This has to be highlighted also. Yeah, of, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Adelali. <laughs> if you want to add something, <laughs> compliment, or I was just referring, you know, to the long range aircraft, uh, actually yeah, uh, to the, yeah. So this, this is something that probably. Uh, I, I think that there are a number of ways we can look at these things because we're now getting out of an era where a, 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 a positive became negative and a negative became positive. Right. So that was the last two years. Uh, no one wants to be positive nowadays. Exactly. Everybody that's wants to be negative. That's what I mean. The, the positive became yeah, negative yeah, and exactly. the negative became exactly. positive. Every time they put something in your nose, you want to be negative. <laughs> exactly. Right? But I think if you look at the whole thing holistically and uh, the, 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 the pragmatically, um, airlines will go to where the customer wants to go. Mm -hmm. True. Uh, and this we just true. got to be conscious of that. Customers' profile is a changing. Uh, and I think we are also, as a human being, we forget very quickly. Mm -hmm. If by end of this year it goes away, in 2022, people will go back to what they were doing in 2019. Okay. Unless the regulator stops them, just like what happened yeah. uh, after September 11 with security. Yeah. So there will be some opportunities, uh, I mean, with longer range aircraft, but still, uh, more or less, the business model will remain to be... You know, I, I think that I think we're getting we're getting narrow body long range Yeah, true. Uh, narrow and, body and that's long range. what yeah. encourages people to go to many more airports, not as to get them. One of the reasons that people were flying into the bigger airport with bigger airplanes, because there wasn't the technology to get them to the smaller airport exactly. for longer. Exactly. Now we're getting that technology, so people will do it. But I think. In, in terms of all the other things that are around, around this industry, it needs to work together, and it has not been uh, at the moment, you know. Fuel is, is a big thing, and, and everybody talks about it. Why airlines are blamed? Because airline industry has failed to telling the world that we are not the bad guys. There is a communication issue here, that's for sure. I mean, trying to communicate. I mean, I mean, after everybody made a lot of noise, uh, we saw a couple of ads by Ayatas and a couple of magazines or somewhere mm -hmm. on TV or something. But this takes a lot of work and a lot of effort True. by manufacturers, by... And a coordinated uh, all, effort. All yeah. bodies coordinated that, efforts, I so. personally believe the industry is not represented or not owned by, by anybody. Mm -hmm. it's, it's floating. And it's an individual effort of each airline to try what they could do best. And, and when you do that, you sort of becomes into a retired mood or you just fight your corner. Now, it's a, it's a very competitive business and we need to compete, which is good for the customer. But I think there's a lot of area that the industry needs to work with it. We're operating in an environment that we're more or less in a monopoly on production of the airplanes. <laughs> and probably the same thing when it comes to engines. We need a bit more competition in those areas to be able to, for them to be able to think and faster generates technology. I mean, airlines will never build an aircraft. You do your best effort to help with the fuel and everything else, but you need those guys, and they're big. Uh, aircraft manufacturers and engine manufacturers are huge. Yeah. Big, big money. True. They can afford to spend and do it. Mm -hmm. and, and they do it in a way that works. So we're driven very lot with no different to automobile. You know, the car manufacturer will decide whether I will put uh, electric or petrol. And yeah. I think the aircraft manufacturer will decide to do that. Otherwise, it becomes an initiative. Fuel oil companies have equally as good big responsibilities of producing a good good fuel, the safe fuel. Uh, and again, they can afford it. Therefore, all those comes back to the regulators. We, one would hope that after this, the, reg the regulators have recognized 
during the pandemic that and the, the reason they supported a lot of airlines most of places in the world because they recognized that without aviation it, it's it's a disaster economy absolutely and, and travel now is a need not a nice mm -hmm. it's a necessity it it's a necessity an and absolute therefore, necessity I, I have no doubt about market returning back and people flying that will happen mm -hmm. and as soon as people are allowed people will this is true. This is true. The propensity for travel is really very high. It yeah. never stopped. It, it was never are, lowered. I mean, it had to do with the travel restrictions or... In yeah. developed countries also, everybody has not spent money for two years, so they, they want to spend <laughs> it. They want to spend it somewhere. And we hope that this will be travel, air travel. Oh, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Thank you. So, airports now. The uh, airport side. Yeah, we will look from a different perspective. Um, we are currently rebuilding the connectivity all around the world and as Istanbul we benefited quite a lot um, in the in the last uh, year or so because there was no direct P2P be yeah. between less popular uh, de uh, destinations uh, in, the, in, in our region at least but we have to acknowledge that P2P is beating the hub model on certain on certain uh, segments of the business uh, especially on the narrow body side, we are, wherever the narrow body air, air, aircrafts are reaching, we see P2P is becoming more appealing, and especially uh, Ryanair, certain, certain the Pegasus, and, and similar EasyJet keep adding new routes between, sure. between destinations. Having said that, I should be also saying that uh, hub model is still working for intercontinental connecting flights. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, and that's where we see the growth going yeah. forward. In the long haul routes. In the, the long, long haul, long haul routes. routes, yeah. yeah. And, and that's, that is proving that the benefits of, of hub, hub and spoke or hub model for airlines and the passengers are still valid. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we will see the same contraction on the intercontinental. But now we are going to have narrow body, long range flights, True. Uh, aircrafts coming. And that's becoming, that may change the scene a bit. We may see Pegasus flying more destinations and beating Turkish airline in the market. They could reach Africa or yeah. other, yeah. But, but at the same time, for Turkish airline, uh, there are a lot of unprofitable destinations, especially in Africa and Asia, where they don't fly because the white body is expensive. So these are white spots that they could take yeah. advantage of. Yeah. But at the same time, there's, there, this is the opportunity for Turkey because Turkish airline may fly more destinations in Africa mm -hmm. and Asia where mm -hmm. the growth is. But at the same time, there's, there's a threat, which is the Middle Eastern and Gulf carriers. Yeah. Because once they, have did those, they, once they put those long-range narrow body aircrafts in their, in, their, in their fleet, they can reach Europe easily. They, don't, they, they, they should not use white body aircraft just to fly to Frankfurt or anywhere in in, in the in, 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 in Europe where the market is relatively mm -hmm. rich. What we see is low cost carriers have not been successful between US and, and Europe connection. But with this new aircraft, definitely more operational uh, operational I mean less operational cost embedded, we may, we will see definitely more competition. And I think from our perspective as infrastructure provider, competition is good. Absolutely. And, but Absolutely, that's true. At the same time, I have from to, I have to un emphasize we built Istanbul as a hub. So in case Turkish airline loses its strength as, yeah. a, as a hub operator, I think the infrastructure we have in Istanbul is going to be abundant for yeah. P2P yeah. business. Yeah. business. Yeah. But at the same time, I think for Turkey, once these narrow body long range aircrafts are available, we will see a definitely much stronger second yeah, flagship yeah. carrier, Pegasus, Somewhere more in the game. Somewhere in 2023, 2024, yeah. I yeah. think this is the, yeah, 2024. Uh, I, I may just interrupt, uh, a couple of things. The definition of long haul has Changes. changed. <laughs> exactly. It used to be six, seven, eight hours long yeah, haul. Yeah, true. Now it's 14 and 15 hours, and that, I think, will stay there. So you have Australia to London? Those, yeah. So I, yeah. When I started my, my life between Sydney and London, the aircraft had to do it two stops in the middle. Of course, of course, yeah. of course. Uh, and then today they can do it with one, and maybe in the future with none. So that, that, that I, I, I think, one, the, the other bit is the, the, the natural market growth. 
I think with the pressure on busy airports and, and the environment and everything else, we won't be able just to put more airplanes, but the market is growing and it will grow because people's quality of life is changing and traveling will only increase. Mm -hmm. So I, I do not see a, uh, a major drop for anybody. I just see a, a natural growth. Yeah, a natural growth going on. Thank you. Well, Dr. Basi, one thing I wanted to sure. add, the, the growth of Pegasus in Turkey has been spectacular. Okay, we know that. It's one I of mean, our so customers. There's you a know, success one of low-cost carrier versus a flagship carrier. Therefore, I mean, it's very comforting what you are telling me, but at the same time, if the, I mean, if the hub carrier of, of, the, of, of an airport loses its market versus against the LCC or other competing airlines, then it's a huge risk for airport operators. Yeah, true. A comment, Dr. Parasis? I think uh, there are a few uh, things that we have learned also uh, during the pandemic and uh, we, need, we need to see whether will, there will be lasting. Uh, resilience is, is very important and I think there are four features which define aviation resilience during the pandemic and that was I think leisure was definitely more resilient than business. Point to point was a preference versus a transfer and hubbing model. Short haul definitely prevailed for different reasons over long haul and the summer was a big a bigger uh, you know it was, yeah. was much more resilient the than the winter. So I think whatever business model um, can serve these four features or, and also whatever technology is mm -hmm. able to uh, serve these uh, features better, for example, low-cost carriers versus, um, uh, let's say, legacy carriers or hub, hub carriers, or whether it was you know, short-haul aircraft and narrow-body long-haul in, in the future, maybe, uh, which serves better point-to-point, -point, uh, is better fit for leisure, um, uh, is, I think, uh, has some uh, competitive advantages vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, let's say, for uh, engine uh, A380, where we have seen the back and forth uh, uh, of retiring aircraft and not retiring aircraft and likes. So I think um, th there are uh, definitely uh, strong um, uh, elements uh, for certain technologies and, and business models. We need to see whether the, the losers of the, whether it's the, business model, the, the, the business traffic, which will be partly substituted by digital or whatever, whether the hubbing, hubbing if, if long haul uh, in, in markets like Asia, in markets like uh, intercontinental, in markets like Africa and South America, prevails uh, and, and, and is going to be around, uh, we have to see the conflict between that and the fact that 80% you know, of the emissions, whatever the emissions are, but 88% of the emissions are generated but through long, medium and long haul. And long so long haul. these questions will definitely play a role in the future. And uh, therefore, I think, yes, uh, there are uh, technologies which will be uh, essential in order to be able to cope uh, with uh, the evolution which has been accelerated with those features uh, of, the, mm -hmm. of, the, of the pandemic. Thank you. So we've discussed about technology and technological advancements and um, these also, we can see that they have impacted the workplace as well, especially the aviation workplace. Now we have been discussing about the pandemic as the great accelerator or the absolute disruptor and we have also seen that we have now robotics and automation in the aviation workplace. Uh, be that for the improvement of sani sanitation or resolving service desk bottlenecks. We have even an airline, I think it's Air Asia. they started in 2020, what they call the RPA, the Robotic Process Automation for the clerical work, for the administrative work. And on the other hand, uh, we have other repercussions of the pandemic in the workplace. We used to say that organizations, they were competing, the, the companies were competing uh, now the companies are competing for people. We used to say that people um, now are no longer competing for jobs. It's the companies, they are competing for people. And we tend to see that organizations, they face the biggest talent crisis since 2008. At least this is what the statistics say. 
some of the statistics here, I have them, 41% of the global workforce are considering resigning from their current roles, 95% are considering a job change, workers are facing burnout, dips in morale, feelings of disconnection from their current job. So I think I will start from the airport business, from Mr. Samson Lu, and do you foresee big changes in the aviation workplace? Do you think that there are, there are many heavy repercussions from the pandemic in the aviation workplace? Uh, I would say yes and no. There will be definitely, I mean, definitely more, we will be more um, caring about the well-being of our employees. Mm -hmm. We should be definitely introducing as much as we can flexible working schemes in our, in our uh, processes. We are not like Pegasus or the airlines going two times, twice a week to the office because since we are operating the airport, we should be there all the time. <laughs> so the manager rate is up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in our case, there is no problem. With no problem. With so they, 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 have been, they have been there all the time. So, um, from um, uh, we, we need, what we what we learned here is the the expectations of the passengers after this pandemic is is, is definitely higher than pre-pandemic, uh, and they would like to have more personalized care at the airports, and to do that. Um, you need to really educate and mm -hmm. provide training to your to your people. Yeah. The biggest challenge we have in Turkey, I don't, I think it's uh, it's it's in our D DNA. We are lacking, I mean, language skills. I mean, most of my, em my employees in the company and also in our in our um, partnering companies do lack people with minimum acceptable, let's say, English level. And to to meet this problem. We, we, we commence a very extensive training, I mean, language training courses in Istanbul because we are a hub. Everybody expects you to, I mean, everybody expects everybody to speak course, at least course, a basic course. English. But mm -hmm. if the security, if the cleaning people do not even understand what the customer requests, then there's, there's, there's a huge, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, customer experience failure in your operation. And therefore, and on top of that, we would like to, I mean, equip them with necessary skill sets to be able to provide solutions when an, a customer come with a request. And we are seeing, I mean, regardless of how, how many wayfindings you put there, how many digital solutions you introduce, customers would like to ask you. I'm hiding my badge every time I'm getting out of my <laughs> office because I cannot go where I need to be because they keep asking me. <laughs> they keep this, asking, that's, that. true, I mean, that's true. I'm sure that's true. You, you, I mean, you go through the same. Therefore, I think the key element is that we need to have a more personalized journey. We need to have, uh, we need to channel our, our human resources to come up with innovative, innovative solutions to push the uh, customer experience higher and, and definitely as I said before, hygiene, sanitation, cleaning is going to be key, not just for, for my people, but also for all the customers of the, of mm -hmm. the airports. And reskilling, of course. Reskilling right. of the personnel. I mean, this, is also, I mean, this is also highly important. The, because everybody has a competing, competing group. We are competing with, with Amsterdam, we are competing with Frankfurt, we are competing with Dubai. I see what's, what they have. Yeah. And I'm trying to I meet up the meet up the gap to keep up between with between yeah, yeah. us and the yeah. other competing uh, competing hubs uh, in the region. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Paraskis. We continue with the airports. So well, I think yeah, the, the, there are definitely um, uh, macro trends there. Uh, I mean, the work-life balance among employees is is definitely a phenomenon which uh, has been around uh, before the pandemic. The pandemic has also uh, enforced or, or, or uh, uh, the uh, different thinking of uh, uh, among employees uh, has introduced other methods uh, like work from home, remote and, uh, work, yes, and, yeah. and, 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 and things like that. We have we have created a totally different perception of people uh, towards uh, the nine to five uh, standard uh, or uh, shift job. Uh, but we have uh, these days also uh, disruptions. Uh, we have uh, I definitely uh, inflatory pressures uh, when it comes to to, uh, uh, to labor costs, uh, and uh, we have also shortage of uh, of available skilled staff. 
uh, which are uh, uh, in the past have been structural issues for aviation in general. We have been uh, in need mm -hmm. of uh, in, uh, having to produce and, and train uh, skilled workers uh, in the industry. Now the pandemic has reduced that, but definitely it's a long-term uh, pressure. But I think uh, uh, labor costs and the digital world, and the digital world um, has, on the one hand, changes the, work, the, the way we work, but at the same time, is an industry which has very much benefited from the pandemic and which is also very much attractive mm -hmm. to younger mm -hmm. skilled uh, workers. And uh, so Talented avi personnel. aviation is not the, the, let's say, the dream job for many as it used to be, uh, airports or airlines. The digital world is a, a world true. of opportunity to which we, and we see that uh, in our, uh, among our skilled people, not only in the area of uh, telecommunication, IT, but overall the world of innovation uh, tends to move away. So mm -hmm. this is also something which we need to make sure we don't lose because we are a bit of a, of a legacy industry and we need to make sure that we keep up with technological evolution and with innovation. Because we will be competing for people. I mean, yeah, this is true. What about the airline business? Thank so you. I, I, I think the, the, the statistics that we see today is, is really a judgment of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we, we sent people away and then people changed their life and their style. And if you were close to retirement, you don't want to go back. Right? It's what they call the great resignation. Eh? They yeah. don't want to, they, they just resign, they don't want to go back. Don't to go back. The whole thing has changed. But the reality is, and this probably are some parts of Europe or countries where the government pays you to stay at home. Yeah. The world has got hundreds of millions of unemployed people. Uh, Digitalization, I think, would not need the mass people that a service industry requires. So unless we provide, unless people work, and in people connecting business people work, right? people will not be able to travel because they won't get paid. Mm -hmm. So we want people to work so they can have income, so they can travel more. Personal experience, Six months ago, our business in UAE particularly uh, had picked up because every, everybody was vaccinated and so on. Yeah, we were short of, in a small fleet that we have got, 60 aeroplanes, 600 cabin crew. Right? Today, I'm short of 50. Yeah. Uh, flight crew, yeah, we stopped training them. Uh, for a period, so there was no new first officer coming, and so on. But very quickly you catch up. And the noise that we used to hear it in the system, on the radios in the mornings about the world short of people, and people are not coming back to job, I find it reducing. Okay. Nobody wants to sit at home. People want to work because they get Now they want to go back. I don't believe, I mean, maybe the life, the, the work-life balance will change and perhaps the technology at the airports and so on can happen. Mm -hmm. But I'm uh, an old style that I think we are in people's business. And you need people to do the job, to do the job, to do the job efficiently. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Mr. Nanen. I would like to set the table in a different manner. Mm -hmm. First of all, aviation is not a single industry by itself. When you look at aviation, we have the pilots and the cockpit ground handling, which is terminal and upfront, technicians, and the headquarters. In the headquarters, different departments. So, this is one fact. The other fact, I love this, a another comic story about me. <laughs> they are talking lots of Gen Z, Gen Z, Gen Z. First, when I heard, I said that. What's you this? know Jay Z, the singer? What the hell is Jay-Z doing in this <laughs> context? <laughs> then I got it. Generation Z, Generation they are Z, calling yeah. Gen Z. Yeah. Gen so Z, I Gen learned Z. that it's not Jay-Z. The Gen Z, their habits are different. They are not like us. They are getting bored easily. 
they are not loyal in that context and they think life is like their social media. If you don't like me, stop me or delete me all. from that's your all. Con followers, that's all. And they're looking business life like that. This is the second fa fact. Thirdly, the especially the headquarters people, they started to used to work from home. So they saw that if not going to the office, they can work from home. When you're not going to the office, your belonging, your loyalty to the office, to the team is getting weaker. So if you are home, you can be working anywhere. Just as statistics, last year, according to the Turkish Technical Associ Technology Association, 300,000 300,000 software operators and system analysts resigned in Turkey. 80% of them are staying in Turkey. All of them are working for the international companies. Okay. Getting hard currency, staying at home, staying in the country and making quadruple the revenue amount of the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, when you combine all of these, HR people, technology, IT people, digital marketing people, and one more fact, what happened during this pandemic crisis in the last two years? Which industries are boosted? E-commerce people and delivery people. True. So e-commerce people are sucking the technological guys, marketing guys, digital guys. And what happened on the other part, which you have to be there to operate, pilots, hostesses, stewardesses, the ground handling and the technicians, they fly much less. When they fly, when you fly less, less income. Yeah, of course. Of so course. when you have less income, what you're going to do to maximize your income to the household? Look at other opportunities. Again, statistics, one of our expat pilots because he couldn't be able to fly during the pandemic period as he used to. Mm -hmm. He's a Swiss citizen. He became tram driver in Geneva. Tram driver and he's making more money. And he resigned from our company. It's a unique case, but he said that I'm making more money as a tram driver. Yeah, so it's what they say that the great resignation becomes the great renegotiation actually between so the companies and the people and of course it's Gen Z and it's Gen Alpha, Generation Alpha which is along the way now. Eh? So it will be another, mm -hmm. a new generation of people and of working force in a few years from now. So, when so you this is also a very interesting challenge. People are not loyal anymore. People are not coming to the offices so they can work anywhere. Yep. There is a huge demand on certain areas like the digital people, technology people, marketing people and certain industries get benefited from this pandemic period mm -hmm. and aviation is not one of those. So what happened? Great generation or great migration. Will this continue when we look at the current macroeconomical situation of the globe? and microeconomical situations of the respective countries. I think this will continue for a bit, time, bit of time. Mm -hmm. But this is also increasing the wages. It means cost. And if you do could, could not be able to reflect this to your ticket prices, to your ancillary prices, how come you're going to finance this? Sure. So this is going to be a kind of vicious cycle. I hope we can able to break this. But as long as the technology demand for certain disciplines are increasing, the costs will increase and we have to carry that. And as long as we can carry no problem, but if we cannot carry it to a certain extent, we have to reflect it to the customer. That's the start of the vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for these very interesting points, all of you. Uh, now a specific question for each one of the panelists. And I think I will start with Mr. Adelali. Well, Air Arabia is the first and largest low-cost carrier in the Middle East and North Africa. It has grown to become a leading low-cost carrier, especially in, in global emerging markets. And if I have the information right, um, you have 120 
Airbus A320 family aircraft on order with delivery starting in 2024. So what's next in terms of growth, development, route development and connectivity? I would like to hear you say Athens, but okay, you can say other destinations as well, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, think, I think, you know, you, you order, oh, the good thing is we ordered all these in 2018. And at the time, Airbus was saying, the earliest you can have is 2024, and we were fighting, we wanted them earlier. <laughs> uh, 2020, everybody thought we were so clever that we ordered for 2024. Uh, so it worked. Uh, but you get airplanes and you fly wherever the people want to go. Yeah. Uh, so, so the reason we put the order in, because we've got an expansion plan in almost every hub. We have got a new hub in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, I know. That yes, only has know four airplanes, yeah. and that needs uh, more than 30. And a strategic cooperation with Etihad. With Etihad, Etihad, Etihad yeah. Japan, we, 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 we're opening two new airlines, one yeah. in uh, Yerevan, in, in uh, Armenia, and one in uh, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, Pakistan is a 200 million people. Uh, as soon as they, as they start to travel a lot, then it domestic, will be their a Their domestic big success. market in itself is yeah. big. Yeah. And in the aviation industry is pretty small. Uh, our Moroccan hub needs a growth, our Egyptian hub needs a growth. And so I, I think we currently gone to the market to get 12 aeroplane as a lease to close the gap because yeah. we're really sure. And we believe that the, the ongoing market growth will need that and more. So Athens has picked up <laughs> very well. Uh, in, in it's, it's a very good market. In it's a very yes, it, efficient it, it market. Is. And I think, I think it could be very much on the radar. Good. That's good to hear. That's very good to hear. Of course, of course. Shaz Athens, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. In 2009. In 2009, yeah. Okay, so I got what I wanted. That's good. Yes. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, a question for you, Mr. Nane. Uh, first of all, congratulations, sir on your appointment as the chair of the IATA Board of Governors recently. Now, commenting on your appointment, you have stated, we will overcome these challenging times by joining our forces together. So could you elaborate more? What will be your priorities for a speedy recovery in our industry? And how can airports, airlines, and all other stakeholders work closer together for a better future in aviation? As I told you about the sustainability you have mentioned side, that. Yeah. Yeah. airlines are not by themselves can operate the business. We need the airports. Mm -hmm. We need the OEM manufacturers, engine manufacturers. When we go abroad, besides the airports, we need the ground handling companies. So it's a fuel service providers, catering providers, cleaning providers. So it's a joint effort. If we want to work in a harmony, like an orchestra, if everybody plays according to their own tone, what happens? <laughs> we discord. call it cacophony. <laughs> exactly. But exactly. if everybody plays according to the maestro's direction, what happens? We clap it. This is and true. it will be this a nice orchestra and nice presentation. So these forces must work together. If you do not know the requirements of the airport, or the ground handling companies, or if they do not know our requirements, and if everybody does whatever right for themselves only, we polarize the industry. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have to come together, not have to, we must come together, and we have to act together in order to recover from this pandemic. This pandemic was, have you ever saw the graphic by the, if I'm not wrong, it was the ICAO's graphic, in 2021's report about 2020. They put down since 1945 all of the global crisis and how it's affected the airline industry. So even the Korean, cri the Korean War, Vietnamese War, the fuel crisis in 73, 9-11, 2008 crisis, either it was flat or a little bit down. But when we come to the 2020 pandemic, it was a huge goes down, yeah. huge cutting edge. So if we want to get out of this, we have to work together, understand each other together. Else, who's going to get lost? 
All, of all the industry. Yeah, yeah, true. All the industry and moreover our passengers. Mm -hmm. So this is what I would like to highlight in that context. And I believe at heart that it has to be in unity. We have to understand each other and we have to learn how to compromise each other. This is true. If we insist that I'm right, I have to survive. No, we have to compromise together in order to expand the cake. If we do not expand the cake, it will be really big issue for all of us. So it's about cooperation, synergies, concerted actions Everything. among among all the stakeholders, let's say. For the sustainability value, of value the industry. Chain. Thank you. Now, Mr. Sams Samson Lu, for the uh, Istanbul Grand Airport. In 2021, Istanbul Grand Airport was presented with the Accessible Airport Award by the ACI Europe in association with the European Disability Forum. The airport was praised by the judges for the innovative solutions in this area. So can you tell us, sir, a little bit more about them, as well as elaborate on how Istanbul Grand Airport has embraced innovation in your everyday operations? Um, I will share a personal uh, fact about, about, uh, about this, this, this issue. Um, I have one, an autistic child in my okay. family. Mm -hmm. Therefore, um, uh, I'm very sensitive about uh, uh, issues of people with restricted mobility or people with disab various disabilities. Mm -hmm. Some of them mm -hmm. are hidden, some of them are visible. And from the first day of, the co of, the co of, the, of my employment at EGA, when we were planning for the operation, I put a very special emphasis on what to do to these people with a lot of issues. Yeah. To transport, I mean, for, I mean, to transport in the, in the country or via Istanbul to a final destination. And I always relay the message to my people saying that they are not different and in fact they are privileged because we need to be helping them to access to the facility and at the same time we should also provide them independence in finding their yeah. ways around because they are frustrated and sick of getting support or shoulder from, from regular people like us. They, they want to be, be acting independently mm -hmm. inside, the, inside the terminal. They want to be going to the uh, F bridges themselves. They want to find their, their, their way uh, without getting any hand or any kind of uh, third person yeah. inside the terminal. And with this, with this goal, we added a lot of um, I say options or a lot of products. A lot of in, solutions, and, and, and also these. the solutions yep. uh, in Istanbul. Um, some of them, are, and 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 the per, and the per target is is simple. They, we have to provide enough wayfinding, and we have to provide enough information via different sources. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you need to use technology, which is obvious, and you should also educate your people. Who is going to be using? Uh, who is going sure. to be learning? Uh, how to how to talk uh, with this, with the people with the, with the disabilities, or how to support them in finding their way around big air big terminal like like in Istanbul. And on top of that, um, for instance, an autistic child is already quite quite bothered with the crowd. Yeah, with the okay. crowd and the sound and the noises. Some, yes. some privacy. And mm -hmm. to, do, to do that, we put two special rooms on the, on, the, on the land side and two special rooms on the air side. One for domestic yeah. Yeah. part of the of airport and the other one the international part of the airport. And we have over 100 people in, in the team who are able to use the sign language. Mm -hmm. We have the application which is going to be I mean, supported with the, with the voice system, so they can really with the and with the augmented reality, they can find their way in the airport by just listening to that, taking right. the directions. And and why we are doing this is is simply because their life is already very restricted, and the families are already, I mean, killing themselves to support these this, this, this people with disabilities, and they also have the right to travel, not only in Turkey but also. Everywhere. I mean, internationally, yeah, and course. and we are seeing people. I mean, kid. I mean, people with disabilities coming from coming from United States and going to Pakistan. Imagine the imagine the problem the the, the, the family is Absolutely, is yes. dealing yes, yes, from yes, the yes. first minute of the trip. Mm -hmm. And what you need to do is basically give them a hand, and so they will take breaks 
during the travel, and mm -hmm. so these people will also be able to see, go and meet with their, with their, with their I mean, relatives, and also go, go and see the, I mean, places that we also like to see as, 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 as a leisure. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, um, that's, that's, a, that's a special uh, area for, for IGA, and going forward we will continue adding more on, on, I mean, on this, and as long as I'm here, um, I'm here meaning, I mean, in the company, I will also seek for better options, <coughs> better solutions for the people with disabilities to, tra to travel and have independence while they are using mm -hmm. the facility. Thank you. So it's technology, infrastructure, training of personnel. Very key. Yeah. And key. cooperation with airlines. Of course. And absolutely. cooperation with airlines. Thank you. Thank we you are, very we much. We are encouraging all airlines to, to pass us to the, train names, the name of the, mm -hmm. of the passengers with, with disabilities or the name of the passengers with PRM. Okay. Thank you, thank you. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Paraschis, we have been discussing a little bit about environment sustainability. Now, I happen to know that back in December 2019, Athens International Airport announced its highly ambitious yet feasible Route 2025 initiative, aiming at, uh, aiming at net zero carbon emissions up to 2025. And I happen also to know that despite the pandemic, this investment plan was not seized, it continued. So can you tell us a little bit more about Route 2025 as well as about sustainability and environmental strategy of Athens International Airport? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to, to link it a bit to the, to the previous topic about uh, the human factor, the, our, our, our labor force and also our ability to, to provide the service and uh, uh, to help also uh, uh, people with disabilities going through our facilities or through our airplanes. I think this, this was the best proof and congratulations. I think we have been through a, a, a program trying to train our people yeah, uh, the autism, at, yes. difficult, at the different stages of the travel uh, through the terminal, uh, being it information, being it uh, terminal assistance, being it security, how to treat this type of people. And uh, it needs, I mean, People with autism, you, you said it, I mean, it's the stress factor being in, in, in a crowded environment. So I think it will be, it will take time before this can be replaced by robotics. Uh, Absolutely, and, yes, and, and yes, yes. We are, we yeah. are a people's uh, business. We are, uh, it also relates, for example, when we talk to, to airports, something very different, very much more banal, but the question about, you know, replacing physical uh, retail at airports through digital options. Yeah, you know, you of course. This, this changes the, the completely the, the, the strengths of this industry. And uh, if you replace impulse buying through digital buying, then you expose yourself to something which is, uh, uh, you're not you're only going to lose. So um, uh, coming back to the sustainability point, uh, yes, I think at the very early stage, we have realized that uh, you know, uh, the, the question of sustainability and energy is not an issue of uh, you know, to ensure a, a license to grow, it's, uh, it will be the license to operate. And, um, and we, we don't want to be a shrinking industry, uh, as many, uh, there are pressures uh, in, in this direction. And we said, you know, we, we, we need to, to move ahead of things. Uh, you mentioned it, uh, the commitment to be net zero by 2050 is, is, is a, uh, is a nice statement, but unless you have uh, very tangible, measurable uh, interim steps, uh, uh, then uh, it's obviously something which is uh, a, a bit empty. And um, then we, we, we looked at uh, options and whether we could uh, also um, do something uh, in the energy sector, uh, at the same time convert it to a reasonable business case. And um, we had gained the experience because, because we have built an 8 megawatt photovoltaic park back in 2011, uh, which accounts for about 20% uh, uh, of our energy, uh, airport company uh, uh, energy consumption, or about 10% of the total airport consumption. And uh, we said, you know, how can we, uh, we have the space, and how we can we um, grow this and become. Uh, uh, truly uh, zero uh, carbon when it comes to electricity at least, uh, which accounts for about 91% of our, of our consumption uh, and, and CO2 production. 
and um, we we committed uh, to do that. Uh, it, it is an ambitious trip. Uh, we have embarked. Uh, of course, there's been. We, you said that the commitment was uh, uh, made back in 2019. Mm -hmm. Then COVID it's came. That was November 19. COVID came, and um, and and unfortunately, it did not only. Uh, make things more difficult for us uh, in terms of revenue, cash, ability to invest, but also it decelerated the technology uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 in the sector. Uh, so we are now in the process of uh, doing the first phase. We would need to, to build a photovoltaic of about 55 megawatts. Uh, we do the first phase now of 16. And the second one would uh, uh, require also the ability to store energy uh, in, in respective uh, battery facilities. There, the technology is not moving as quickly as we would like it, but we are confident that uh, we will get there before 25. So uh, we are we are uh, moving at, at the fast pace, not to become net zero, but become truly zero. Truly zero. Truly zero. We will yes, not yes, offset yes. at yes. all with the network. No offsets. We will. We will, we yeah. will uh, we are currently carbon neutral, but then we will be not not even offsetting with the grid. We will uh, produce and, 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 and mm -hmm. store and and consume uh, at the airport. And uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to deliver in time. <laughs> uh, we are also pressing the Greek government to come up with a regulatory framework for the storage of, uh, of, of energy in batteries, which is a challenging one. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, the, we are optimistic. As I said, we, we, we now soon uh, we move into the implementation of the first phase, which is 16. And then we have another 40 uh, mm -hmm. megawatts we would need to uh, put in place. So we hope that this will be an additional reason to celebrate in 2025, <laughs> hopefully. Now, the last question for today. It's the last one. So I think I will start with Mr. Adelali. I think during all these unprecedented crises, we have quoted Sir Winston Churchill a lot. He used to say back in the at, the, at the end, let's say, of the Second World War, never let a good crisis go to waste. He's credited with saying that. So, of course, this phrase, this phrase causes all of us to look for a silver lining during the crisis and seek opportunities where they might not have not been before. But at the same time, in the case of aviation, it raises the question, have we let this good crisis go to waste? Have we not? If not, what are the lessons learned? So, Mr. Ali. <laughs> Challenging so, question. It is. No, I, I, think, I, think, I think we all, we, we all, it's all about what happens next. Yeah. Okay, so, so I think it, the, the industry or the airlines, surprisingly, um, Probably pre the pandemic, it was more fragile than after the pandemic. Albeit there are a lot of debts and all that sort of thing, but everybody saw the true the risk and the threat ahead back in 2020, and everybody it performed extremely well in getting together within each airline. Mm -hmm. and, and they found a solution at the time that there was zero money almost coming into the airlines. So there was a lot of good thing happened, and mm -hmm. it happened because in, in an airline is, 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 I remember a long, long time ago telling somebody, the problem with the airline, the bigger you get, is like a, a, a bad table which has got lots of things in it. The best way to, to, to really change is take everything off and then start over. But in our business, if you take it off, you'll never start again, <laughs> right? Now the two years has given us an opportunity to probably take most of the thing off the table and re-look at it and bring it back. I, I think for me that is the learning. Those who would succeed is, is now that who will that becomes integral part of their normal work practice. Mm -hmm. To incorporate it. To incorporate, in yeah. And, and those who wouldn't is as soon as the cash starts coming in and business comes back to normality, they go back into what I describe running an airline, not running a business. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So have we let this good crisis go to waste? Have we not? Of course not, especially on the financials, that the costs that we use mm. to reduce yep. will be continuing. What are those costs, for example? What will we continue in our life from now on? First of all, Traveling for international purposes, 
if it is not must, we're not going to travel because we find out the technology of online, mm -hmm. Zoom, WebEx, Global Meet, Teams. This is my third international travel in the last two and a half years. So instead of going for just for a meeting on the Zoom, it's much cost effective. Yeah. Second, home office. Normally we used to give one day per month home office. Currently, we have two days office for the headquarters only and three days home office. But after the normalization, we're planning to give two days per week home office. So we're going to reduce the office square meters. All of these are certain cost issues for us, which we're going to reduce. But on the socialization side and getting used to each other within the department and among the departments, we made certain costs. For example, we give certain allowances for each department in order to socialize internally. Okay. Previously, they were doing this during the cafeteria or the coffee breaks or the cigarette breaks. Or when they are coming, we provide in Turkey services to come. So company-wise, it's a kind of socialization issues. Mm -hmm. None of them are there. So how they are going to socialize, even within the department, we give them allowances. According to that, either they can do the breakfast, lunch, or so the So you incentivize. Dinner. Yeah, incentivize we incentivize. Yeah. Second, we have social clubs. Mm -hmm. Those social clubs reactivated, reactivated. For example, today, they started a yoga class mm -hmm. from different departments, two different yoga teachers. One of them is for Kundalini yoga. The other one is Hatha yoga, something <laughs> like that. Nice. It's coming to our Very office. Nice. People are gathering and they are taking lessons. So these are not from the same departments, from different departments. They are coming together for the socialization. So we inherited all of the, as a low cost, all of the gained cost effective side, cost reductions will stay. Yeah. But we used to have certain additional costs mm -hmm. in order to socialize and unite our employees, which is very crucial for us in a way not to prevent but to push the break for the great migration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, what are the lessons learned? I'm originally a corporate finance guy. I never really pay so much attention on the force majeure <laughs> clauses. I mean, this crisis showed, I mean, definitely proven that we need to be very careful what's, what the force majeure is. Something which was which is not foreseen hit the, hit the industry and yeah. therefore uh, the first, uh, my, my first takeaway is that uh, better risk management going forward and anything even small emerging somewhere in the world should be really paid attention. Second, um, people, employees. I mean, we couldn't go through this crisis without them. And I think everywhere in the, uh, in the sector, airlines, ground handlers, airports, we owe a lot to them. In this crisis, they manage the customers, they manage the processes with limited uh, number, with limited numbers on the ground, and more importantly, all of us, I mean, accepted certain cuts in our, in yeah. our, I mean, compensation for for months, and and that's we were able to do that without really harming the loyalty among them. So the team building is so key. And I, I agree. I mean, we cannot bring everything to, to a digital, digital level. There are, it's still very much human business. Of and course, then, and of in course, this business, people don't want to be fo using the apps to do things at the airport. They want to be touching people. They want to be enjoying the different cultures while they are uh, with, you, with us. And therefore, I think the most important takeaway that I will take is that we have to pay more attention to the well-being of our employees. We have to be supporting the facilities with better sanitation, hygiene, and cleaning. We should not really, I mean, go back to old, old standards of cleaning or hygiene, saying that the pandemic is over. I think it should stay in our business models. And, and of course, all of us, I think the industry is very strong now because we, we, we became more agile, yeah. more adaptive, mm -hmm. and definitely more effective. 
Thank you. So it's about harnessing automation and technology yeah. for a Within human future Within. that works. Within. I yeah. think yeah. that's the... And uh, last but not least, Dr. Parasis. Well, I think it has been said uh, for, for our uh, generations that uh, have uh, uh, moved and have, have in, into business and life. Uh, after the Second World War, we were always uh, used to uh, things will move this way with very, very minor disruptions. I think this has taught us that uh, we are not maybe and, and thankfully uh, uh, not uh, exposed to this type of crisis that previous generations were exposed to, but that definitely we are not uh, um, fully protected uh, from this type of major events of lasting duration and major and major disruptions. But I think the, the, the uh, disruptive impact. But uh, one thing that I, uh, if, if I would compare this crisis with the previous one, which was the global financial crisis, and link it to sustainability, I think, uh, and also this is a lesson learned, I think, for our industry, um, the, the, the sustainability threats and the climate change and all that was very much there during the previous decade, no, actually the, the previous, the 2000s, up until the end of uh, 2010. Uh, then the, the crisis came and, and suddenly th shift, things shifted towards um, focus, macroeconomic yeah. growth yeah. and, 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 and uh, employment. And that gave us almost 10 years where we could escape from that sort of also as an industry from that uh, sort of threat of, of climate change, sustainability pressures, emission trading schemes, uh, emission reduction, all of that. And I think what we learn from this crisis, you cannot permanently escape and it's, uh, you, have to, you need to face things and you need to get better. Otherwise, I think the threat is there and uh, it is, uh, you cannot hide behind the bush. You need to face things, you need to get constantly better and with this, I would like to thank you very much, gentlemen. I think a warm round of applause is due for our top leaders. Thank you very much. It has been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. And I think we are, we are on time. And uh, Professor Papathelodoro will have a concluding remark. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I think we uh, all thoroughly enjoyed this uh, uh, very insightful uh, discussion by uh, uh, four leading personalities in the uh, transport sector, Ms. Adelali from uh, Air Arabia, Mr. Mehmed Nane from uh, uh, Pegasus Airlines, Dr. Yanis Paraskis uh, from Athens International Airport, and Mr. Kadri Samsunlu from uh, uh, IGA Istanbul Airport. Um, I would like also to um, 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 uh, thank uh, uh, Ms. Papadopoulou for a uh, uh, a very uh, inspire, inspiring and uh, thoughtful uh, moderation. Uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, to um, uh, give some concluding remarks, which is uh, uh, obviously quite difficult given the, the overload of uh, information we had. And during the discussion, I, I've been thinking uh, about my son. My son is 10 years old, and uh, one of his uh, very uh, favorite games is uh, Snakes and Ladders. Huh? And when we play that game, I uh, always tell him, okay, do think about ladders and uh, be happy when uh, you go up, but uh, uh, don't cry when you get the snakes. Huh? But um, in retrospect, one of the big problems we had is that uh, um, it's exactly this, complacency, and that has been uh, mentioned quite a lot. And we, we keep uh, uh, admiring the ladders, uh, but we keep forgetting the snakes. Huh? Uh, the air transport sector is um, full of fragile beauties. And the problem is that in many cases we remember the beauties, we um, uh, tend to forget fragility. Back in 2019, uh, IATA published a report that the best you could do from the uh, net profit per passenger was to buy a Big Mac in Switzerland. And that was in 2019 when uh, we all um, mentioned how uh, glorious uh, you know, the future uh, would look like. Now, two years or three years down the line, Things are very different. It's very, very important to uh, uh, understand that uh, uh, you know, in, in this new world uh, where uh, the uh, snakes of uh, COVID-19 uh, have uh, uh, you know, bitten us, if not eaten us, uh, it's quite important to uh, uh, develop resilience from a new point of view. Uh, um, 
very interesting things were mentioned, like uh, the importance to uh, reduce uh, costs at different levels, and not standard operational costs, but uh, uh, things including buildings. Uh, so if we move to uh, a new reality where uh, people can work remotely or from uh, the homes, perhaps we might need uh, uh, a few um, uh, buildings, we might need uh, uh, less uh, um, uh, uh, space in our buildings. Uh, but on the other hand, we do need to uh, uh, remember that we're talking about a people's business, so we need to uh, uh, create new space for a socialization of employees, and uh, work-life balance was also mentioned in, 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 in many cases. So uh, uh, on the one hand, we need to reduce costs, on the other hand, we do need to acknowledge potential new sources of um, uh, investment that we should make, and especially in terms of uh, uh, people. Cash is king also, uh, very, very important because of uh, uh, the pandemic, and in spite of all the uh, uh, different subsidies and state aid, uh, uh, the ones that are going to thrive in the future are those uh, that manage to uh, secure a good cash uh, position in maybe before the pandemic, and that would allow them also to build capacity in uh, uh, the years to come. Of course, uh, uh, we need to consider uh, um, ECG, environmental uh, sus uh, sustainability, social sustainability, and governments, uh, both internal and external, in terms of the different stakeholders. Uh, in this context, it's very important for uh, uh, the different uh, um, suppliers uh, to come together. In the past, we uh, typically talked about the uh, love and hate relationship between airlines and airports. Obviously, um, supply chain disruption, supply chain conflict will still exist, but I think that we're now moving more uh, towards um, um, exploiting different synergies, realizing uh, the ability for orchestrated efforts, realizing the uh, um, ability to become more adaptive and more flexible uh, in the new environment. In this context, we will now have to uh, uh, consider new challenges as well. A lot was mentioned about the environment uh, in terms of uh, sustainable aviation fuel, uh, whether uh, the infrastructure is there or not, what may happen in terms of uh, uh, synthetic fuel as well. Uh, the uh, uh, hubbing versus de uh, debate is still on. Uh, during uh, the pandemic, we uh, uh, saw a bit of uh, de hubbing as a result of people being more interested in direct flights, but uh, uh, of course, um, uh, we uh, may end up having more of uh, uh, long-range, narrow-body aircraft that would allow uh, the hubbing, but at the same time, uh, hubbing does uh, uh, remain, of, uh, remain of great importance. And then we moved more into people, and we should never forget that um, uh, air transport is uh, uh, the people's business. Uh, we've talked about uh, uh, remote working where possible, but uh, uh, as I said before, very, very important to uh, uh, keep the right work-life balance. Uh, uh, we've talked about the new needs um, of customers, uh, uh, more uh, personalization of services, more customization of services is important. At the same time, it's uh, uh, also of uh, um, uh, great, or I would say of crucial significance to acknowledge uh, the special needs of uh, people facing difficulties, whether these are uh, more, uh, difficulties related to mobility or mental difficulties or any other sort of um, problems that people fa may face. And it's uh, not only a matter of uh, democratizing uh, travel, it's a more a matter of uh, you know, human respect of making all these people uh, feeling uh, independent and uh, able to uh, uh, navigate uh, in a seamless manner through the uh, uh, whole journey experience. Uh, hygiene and sanitization are obviously uh, quite important, and I'm sure that they're here to stay just as uh, advanced security measures were introduced since uh, September 11th in 2001, and as we all know, they are still in place. And at the same time, uh, I think uh, we should also focus on uh, uh, reskilling and upskilling. That's uh, quite important. Uh, uh, people uh, working throughout the uh, uh, transport uh, 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 sector, I think they should be uh, uh, more educated in order to face uh, all these uh, uh, different challenges. Uh, apart from that, uh, uh, once again, um, all uh, uh, speakers uh, uh, didn't mention the uh, uh, need to, uh, for further partnerships, the need to uh, uh, move forwards. And um, 
uh, in, in conclusion, I think that uh, we're gradually moving into uh, a new uh, normality. Uh, we all hope that uh, uh, we will be able to uh, climb new ladders uh, very soon. Uh, but I think that we're now all fully aware of uh, the different uh, snakes uh, that exist. And in this context, I think education uh, can play a, a leading role. Uh, we should all be educated at uh, different levels. And uh, just uh, as a concluding note, I would like to happily announce that a few months ago, uh, Her Mercer uh, Transport Organization signed an MOU with uh, my university, the University of Virginia, about some uh, uh, new uh, uh, educational initiatives, especially at uh, postgraduate level, and uh, nice things will be announced soon. So thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thank you so much for such an insightful uh, discussion.